prayer together from the 93rd Psalm, Lord Reign in Me. Over all the earth you reign on high, every mountain stream, every sunset sky, but my one request, Lord, my only aim is that you rain Good morning, brothers and sisters. So good to see you this morning. 
so good to see you in the Lord's house. We've come here to worship because God has been good to us. He has saved us through the work of His Son. He has forgiven us of all of our sins by the blood of His Son and by His wonderful grace. He has filled us with His Holy Spirit and He is sanctifying us and preparing us for that great day that is coming. Are you ready for that day? Well, this is the best way to get ready for that day is to gather with God's people. This is finally what heaven is going to be. It is going to be God's people all gathering together in the presence of the Lord and we will serve Him and worship Him forever. And so being together, singing together, serving together, worshiping together is a foretaste of the glory that is awaiting all of us. There's so much more to it than that. But this is what the gathering of God's people is. It is a looking forward to that great gathering time. People have been separated and walls have been built up between people. But the Bible says that through the work of Jesus, God has knocked down all of those walls so that God can bring all people together under one Lord, our Lord Jesus Christ. I hope this morning that He is your Lord, that He is truly your Lord, that He is truly your Savior, that you have truly turned to Him for salvation and for hope and for peace and for joy and all the wonderful blessings that come to us through our Lord Jesus Christ. I'm so glad to be in the sanctuary of the Lord with God's family, with God's people. And isn't it wonderful to know that all over this world, all around the globe today, this great big world, that there are people just like us who speak all kinds of different languages, who don't look like us, whose culture is different than ours, but who has the same Lord that they are gathering to worship just like we are today. That is a great comfort to me that God has people all over the world and we're going to be gathered together with all of them someday. Uh, praise God that Sister Sharon uh, is doing so well. Uh, Sharon Arnold is recovering wonderfully and God has been so good. I mean, the, the, the procedure went so well, the recovery is going so well. And so uh, we just give thanks to God uh, for that. Continue to pray for her and for David and the, and the bunch as they care for her. It's great that Sister Diana is doing so well, that she's recovering. And I asked Phil, but we are going to have, the Jason will probably tell us about this later, we are going to have the uh, fall festival at the Stokes house uh, that we've had, I don't know how many years, somebody, maybe a church historian less can tell us, I don't know, 30 years, 40 years, 150 years, two, 300 years, something like that. We've been having this thing, and we're going to have it this year as well, uh, so so be making plans for that. I do want to, before we... We're going to say the creed today, and I want you to, here in just a minute, uh, grab a hold of somebody, and we're going to pray together. Uh, before we do that, we're going to say the creed, but be praying for the Bennett family. Many of you probably know uh, uh, Joanne uh, Bennett Wade, and he has uh, five siblings, uh, their sweet mother, uh, who's been in our community for such a long time, faithful member of the Methodist Church. Uh, she... Uh, she passed away a few days ago, and her service is going to be tomorrow. There, there will be a visitation tonight as well. Uh, so be praying for the Bennett family. Okay, does everybody have a bulletin? No, somebody doesn't back there. Okay, get that child a bulletin. <laughs> we don't read this every week, uh, but it's printed every week. This is, this is a statement of faith. This, this is the Word of God being brought together and condensed into a statement that God's people have been saying together for literally hundreds and hundreds of years. That we did not make this up. This, the truth that is contained in these words is making us because, because it is true. It is God's truth. And it is the most amazing truth imaginable. No one could have made up this story. The greatest story that has ever been told is in God's Word. No one could have imagined such a wonderful, glorious thing. By the way, uh, if, if you haven't been coming on Wednesday nights, I want to invite you to do that. We have a great time on Wednesday nights. This Wednesday, we're going to give Tim and Marion and the others a break uh, from preparing the amazing, wonderful meals that they have been preparing. Uh, we are going to meet for church, but if you've not been coming on Wednesday nights, I want to invite you to do that. We have a great time here. Uh, and we've been talking about some of these things on Wednesday night. Matter of fact, this last Wednesday night, we began to work through the, the Nicene Creed and, and what it means. But today, we're going to say it together. Would you confess 
these words with me. We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of His Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day He rose again according to the Scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father and He shall come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead whose kingdom shall have no end. And we believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And we believe in one holy church. We acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and we look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Take a hold of somebody. If you can hold someone's hand, maybe someone in your family there, or maybe put your hand on someone's shoulder. Marion's going to play for just a moment as we continue to worship, prepare our hearts for worship, and then we're going to pray together. Lord, what an inexpressible comfort to be in your house with your people, to be in this sanctuary, a family, a place of refuge and a place of help and a place of encouragement and a place of truth, a place of peace and a place of joy. This household of faith that you have created by your grace, by the work of your Son, by the work of your spirit who has called us and brought us together and has bound our hearts together as brothers and sisters in Christ. We have one another. We are not alone in this world. And we're thankful, Father, to be your children, to know that you know us, and that you love us, that we can love one another and pray for one another and encourage one another and forgive one another, and be forgiven, and be reconciled to one another in a world that is so fractured and so broken, that we can find unity and healing in your Son. Lord, I'm so thankful for every person who is here. What a privilege to be able to stand here and look out over this congregation to see these children of God who have been redeemed out of the slavery of sin and who have been adopted into your family and whose sins are forgiven and whose citizenship is in the eternal kingdom of heaven that will never pass away. Even though the heavens and the earth, this created world, may pass away. Your word will never pass away. Your kingdom will never pass away. Your kingdom will have no end. It is the kingdom of the King of kings and the Lord of lords who laid down his life for us, who shed his blood for us, who saves us, who rescues us, who brings us out of darkness 
into his wonderful light. He is the light of the world. What an inexpressible comfort, Father, to be in your presence, the presence of your Son and your Spirit with your people. What a comfort to be able to pray together with one voice to our Father, which art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Ephesians chapter 6, 14 says, Stand, therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness. This hymn story goes back about 163 years to a time in our nation's history right before we were about to be torn apart by a great civil war. Dudley Ting, T-Y-N-G, Dudley Ting, served as his father's assistant pastor at Philadelphia's Church of the Epiphany. And then he was elected later as its pastor when his father retired in 1854. He was only 29 when he succeeded his father at this large Episcopal church. And at first it seemed that they were a great fit. But the honeymoon ended when Dudley began vigorously preaching against the issue of slavery. Loud complaints rose from the more conservative members, resulting in Dudley's reading the handwriting on the wall. He was no longer wanted. He resigned in 1856. <laughs> preaching about an important cultural issue was uh, something that made folks uncomfortable. And so he was no longer the pastor. Hmm. He and his followers organized the Church of the Covenant elsewhere in the city of Philadelphia. And his reputation began to grow as someone who was reaching out to to particularly men. He began noontime Bible studies at the YMCA and his ministry reached far beyond his own church walls. He had a burden for leading husbands and fathers to Christ and he helped organize a great rally to reach men in the 1850s. It was on a Tuesday, March 30th, 1858, he was preaching to 5,000 men who were gathered. As Dudley looked over this sea of faces, he just felt this overwhelming burden. And he, he, he famously said, I would rather this right arm were amputated at the trunk than that I should come short of my duty to you in delivering God's message. That's what he told the crowd. It was mm. A, mm. A, an amazing, powerful message. Over a thousand men were converted on just that one service that day. Two weeks later, Dudley Ting was visiting in the countryside, watching a massive corn thrasher in the barn. His hand moved too close to the machine. His sleeve was snared. His arm was ripped from its socket, the main artery severed. Four days later, his right arm was amputated close to his shoulder. When it appeared he was dying, he knew he wasn't going to make it, Dudley and his Aged father, we're having a conversation. His father asked him, son, what should I tell people? And this is what Dudley Ting said. Stand up for Jesus, father, and tell my brethren of the ministry to stand up for Jesus. He passed away. Reverend George Duffield of Philadelphia's Temple Presbyterian Church was deeply stirred by Dudley Ting's funeral. And the following Sunday, he preached from Ephesians six fourteen about standing firm for Christ. He read a poem he had written, inspired by Dudley Ting's message. Stand up, stand up for Jesus, ye soldiers of the cross. Lift high his royal banner, it must not suffer loss. The editor of a hymnal heard the poem, found appropriate music, and published it. Stand up, stand up for Jesus soon became one of America's favorite hymns and it still extends Dudley's dying words to millions.
I'm going to ask you to stand with me. Let's sing a couple of verses of stand up, stand up for Jesus. Stand up, stand up for Jesus, ye soldiers of the cross. Lift high his royal banner, it must not suffer loss. From victory unto victory, his army shall he lead, till Every foe is vanquished, and Christ is Lord indeed. Stand up, stand up for Jesus, stand in his strength alone. The arm of flesh will fail you, ye dare not trust your own. Put on the gospel armor, each piece put on with prayer. Where duty calls or danger, be never wanting them. Stand up, stand up for Jesus, this strife will not be long. This day the noise of battle, the next the victor's song. To those who overcome, a crown of life shall be. He with the King of glory shall reign eternally. have a seat and we'll ask the kids to head back to Children's Church at this time. Amanda and the workers have a great message for you today. Let's sing a couple more songs. We have an anchor. Will your anchor hold in the storms of life? When the clouds unfold their wings of strife. Oh, when the strong tides lift and the cable strain, will your anchor drift or her firm remain? We have an anchor that keeps us all steadfast and sure while the billows roll. Fastened to the rock which cannot move, grounded firm and deep in the Savior's love. Held secure by faith in the Savior's hands, shielded by His grace on Christ we stand. He is Lord of all. We should never doubt through uncertain times. He is solid ground. We have an anchor that keeps us all steadfast and sure while the billows roll. Fastened to the rock which cannot move, grounded firm and deep. In the Savior's love, you have carried us through the raging sea. In the fire and flood, we stand redeemed. Through the storms of life, you will not let go. This our confidence that our anchor holds. We have an anchor that keeps us all steadfast and sure while the billows roll. Fastened to the rock which cannot move. 
grounded firm and deep in the Savior's love. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. The world behind me, the cross before me, the world behind me, the cross before me, the world behind me, his cross before me, no turning back, no turning back, though none go with me, still I will follow, though none go with me, still I will follow, though none go with me, still I will follow, no turning back, no turning Genesis chapter 6. Matthew chapter 13 verses 51 and 52 is a passage that I've studied probably more than any other in the last four or five years of my life. And it is the next passage in Matthew. But once again, it's going to have to go, uh, it's going to have to be set aside until next time. And uh, I have felt led, compelled yesterday and today, to preach about Noah. You'll see the songs we have been singing uh, go along with Noah's life. And I want us to think for a few minutes this morning about the life of Noah from Genesis 5 and 6. I think the life of Noah is especially relevant in the world in which we live today. And so I hope that you will pay careful attention to what the Bible has to say about Noah's life. You've all heard the story before, but I want us to fix our attention once again. I'm not going to have a PowerPoint. I want you to be paying close attention to what your text says here. If you have a Bible or if you have some sort of electronic device that has the Bible on it, I want to invite you to open it to Genesis chapter 6. The title of the message is, What God Found Before the Flood. Genesis 6, beginning in verse 5, the Lord saw, the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord was sorry, the Lord regretted, some translations say the Lord repented, the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth and it grieved him to his heart. It grieved him to his heart. So the Lord said, I will blot out man whom I have created from the face of the ground. Man and beast and creeping things and birds of the air, for I am sorry that I have made them. But Noah found favor or grace in the eyes, in the eyes of the Lord. This passage emphasizes a contrast. The emphasis of the passage is verse 8, but 
Noah. And as I read this passage, I wonder if my name could in some way, somehow be placed there in the world in which I find myself. As God looks around at this world, could God say about me or about you, but this person is different. Noah's name is brought up in chapter 5. There's a long list in chapter 5. This person lived. This person had children. This person died. This person lived. This person had children. This person died. All through this passage, it comes to a couple of people, Enoch and Noah, and there's something special about them. The author stops for a moment and says something unique about these people. Noah, his father, says that he names him with hope. Now Noah's name, these letters, this is one of the things about the untranslatable riches of the original language. In Hebrew, these, word, these letters N and H are featured all through the Noah story from chapter 5, 6, 7, 8, all through the story. These letters N and H, sometimes they're reversed, an H and an N. It sounds like Noah sounds like the Hebrew word for rest, nua. It sounds like the word, word for comfort. It sounds like the word in another Hebrew tense for grief or to grieve. And it also is the reverse of grace or favor. Noah found an H and an N in the eyes of the Lord. So this is something that's very difficult to see in English, but I want to point it out to you that in Hebrew, there's all through the story of Noah a play on Noah's name. The word play comes up first in his father's speech. Look at verse 28, chapter 5. When Lamech had lived 182 years, he became the father of a son and called his name Noah. And this is why. He said, out of the ground which the Lord has cursed, this one shall bring us relief. It sounds like the name Noah shall bring us relief from our work and from the toil of our hands. Noah is going to bring comfort. He's going to bring rest. He's going to bring relief. So his father hoped, maybe this is a prayer that this son as the world gets worse and worse and more and more difficult, as the curse spreads and, it, and life is difficult, the world is becoming more and more wicked, that Noah would bring comfort from the curse. Notice how he hearkens back to this, to Genesis chapter 3, where the ground was cursed because of man's sin and the fall and how everything had turned bad. Lamech looked around and saw a world that was running away from God and said, perhaps in my son something different will come. Noah lived in a corrupted culture. Chapter 6, verses 1 through 4, describe it in this way. I'm just, uh, and then verse 5, I'm just going to read verse 5. Listen to the way the world was. The Lord saw that the wickedness of man, underline this, was great in the earth. And that, underline this, every imagination... Not just the actions of man, but the very thoughts of his mind all the time, running, running all the time, thinking of new ways to do evil. The thoughts of his heart, underline heart, was only evil continually. Sometimes it can seem like we live in the same kind of world. Jesus said, as it was in the days of Noah, so will the coming of the Son of Man be. Do you ever think about, you look around the world and does your heart ever grieve because of this? Everywhere God looked, God wept. When God looked to the north, He wept when He saw man's wickedness. God looked to the south, God wept when He saw man's wickedness. When God looked to the east, God wept when He saw man's wickedness. And when He looked to the west, He wept when He saw man's wickedness. Everywhere God looked, He saw wickedness. And God wept. 
God did not weep because he had made man, but because of what man had made of himself. The Bible says in Ecclesiastes 7.29, This only have I found. God created man upright, but they have gone in search of many schemes. We have turned away from God. God made us upright and good. The Bible says God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God saw that it was very good. God saw that it was very good. And now God looks upon the world. And this is what God sees. What man had made of himself. So the story focuses on what God saw. God is looking. Investigating. It says God saw. God grieved. And God said. Walter Brueggemann said years ago, I heard him preaching on this text, that the flood is God drowning in God's, or God is going to drown God's sorrows. He's focusing on this idea of God grieving and God weeping. And this is what the flood is. The display of God's wrath is God's weeping, God's sorrows, the overflow of God's sorrow. God saw, God grieved, and God said, I'm going to wipe it all out. It's too much for me. To look upon anymore. So everywhere God looked, God saw the wickedness of humanity's heart. And notice, when God saw humanity's heart, it grieved God's heart. It hurt God's heart to see what was going on in the world. So what guys, God's eyes saw hurt God's heart. It reminds us of Jesus looking over Jerusalem. Jesus is the very incarnation of God. He said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And Jesus looks upon Jerusalem that has rejected the gospel. And the Bible says that Jesus wept over the city because they had rejected God's way. Can you imagine in your, in your mind and in your heart, God weeping over our world? Sometimes we think, and in some ways this is right, sometimes we think that God looks down the world and is, and is wrathful and angry. And, that's, and yes, that is a part of it. But more than that, we see in the life of Jesus that when God sees a sinful world destroying itself, God weeps and he grieves. So God's wrath is portrayed as God weeping. But that's not all God saw when God looked at the world of that day. Then the story tells us what God's eyes found before the flood. Noah found favor, underline that, in the eyes of the Lord. This word for favor, I want you to turn over to Genesis 18. We're going to see... Abraham finding favor, and then Exodus 33, and how this idea comes up in the life of Moses as well. So again, this, this word favor is the letters of Noah's name turned around the other direction, so it's related to Noah. Noah found favor. In Genesis chapter 18... Three visitors come to Abraham. And in chapter 3, this is Abraham seeking the favor of God. My Lord, if I have found favor in your sight, do not pass by your servant. Verse 10, the Lord said, I will surely return to you in the spring, and Sarah your wife shall have a son. And Sarah was listening uh, at the tent of the door, and they found favor in God's sight. He asked for favor and he received favor from God. In verse 33, if I have the right verse here. And the Lord went his way. Well, that is, I've written down the wrong verse in, somehow. What Abraham sought from God was his favor. Look upon me. Let your face shine down upon me. Don't turn away from me. Don't turn your back on me. But look upon me with favor. Abraham found favor in God's sight. The Bible tells us that Abraham found favor in God's sight because of his faith. And then Exodus chapter 33. Verses 12 through 14. So we've seen this with Noah. We've seen it with Abraham and now with Moses. Moses said to the Lord, See that thou sayest to me, Bring up this people, but thou hast not let me know whom thou wilt send with me. Well, Moses has this anxiety about what God has called him to do. Yet thou hast said, I know you by name, and you have also found favor 
in my sight. The men of God, this is a thing they long for more than anything else that God would bless them and, and look upon them with favor. Now, therefore, I pray thee, if I have found favor in thy sight, this famous passage, show me now thy ways, that I may know thee and find favor in thy sight. Consider, too, that this nation is thy people. And he said, my presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. Now, that word rest there is also connected to the story of Noah. Noah, God's... Uh, Noah's father wanted rest and comfort. God says to him, I'm going to show you favor and I'm going to give you rest. It's echoed in the saying of Jesus in Matthew chapter 11. Come to me and I will give you rest. We can receive rest from God. We can receive favor from God. Is it possible for us to bring rest to the heart of God? As we go through that story, chapter 33 and chapter 34 Moses does find favor in God's sight, and God blesses him by revealing himself to him. But this is the question in the story of Noah. Why did Noah find favor in the eyes of God when the whole world was breaking God's heart? It says Noah found grace, or Noah found favor in the eyes of God. How did that happen? Some people read this verse and really interpret it out of context and say, this was just Pure grace. And in a sense, everything is pure grace. But some have interpreted to say, well, Noah was no different than anybody else. But God, out of his pure grace, just chose to save through Noah. But Noah was like everyone else. But that is, that is not right. How did Noah find grace in the eyes of God when the whole world was breaking God's heart? Notice verse 10 and following in chapter 6. Noah was a righteous man. Blameless, underline that. In his generation, Noah walked with God. Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight, and the earth was filled with violence. And God saw the earth, and behold, it was corrupt. For all flesh had corrupted their way upon the earth. This passage tells us that there was something different in this world about Noah. Noah found favor in God's eyes because Noah walked with God in righteousness when the rest of the world, the in everyone else in the world was running away from God in wickedness, Noah walked with God, and this, and this is why he found favor in God's sight. Listen to me. I want you to especially use teenagers up here. I want you to listen to me because I know that the world you're growing up in is difficult. And I know that the, there are all kinds of temptations that you face. You carry them around with you in your pocket. I know it's difficult. And I know it can feel like at your school, everybody else, preacher, you don't know what it's like to be on this football team. You don't know what it's like to be in these classrooms. You don't know what it's like to walk these hallways. You don't know what all the... there. It's, it's a difficult place, preacher. It's difficult. And they're tempt Everywhere I look, there are temptations. I want you to understand this, and I want you to see the life of Noah. It is possible to be faithful even in a dismal world. It is possible. You can do it by God's grace. You don't have to follow the crowd. You don't have to go the way everybody else is going. And it's easy to justify it in our heart. Well, everybody else is doing this. It must be okay. You don't have to live like that. You don't have to. What does God see when he looks upon us? He's not going to find perfection. There's only one perfect Jesus is perfect. The Bible says if we say we have no sin, we lie. And the truth is not in us, okay? No one's saying that, that you're going to be perfect. When you fall down, God can raise you back up. But just because we can't be perfect does not mean that we cannot stand out from the rest of the crowd. The Bible says in Philippians 2, 14 through 16. Now, this is interesting. Though. <laughs> this is not what I would expect it to come right before this verse. But I like it. He's thinking about the wilderness generation and how they complained and grumbled all the time. He says, do all things without grumbling or complaining. Now, we could preach the rest of the time just on that. That you may be blameless and innocent. Now, underline this. Children of God without blemish in the middle of a crooked and perverse generation. Among whom... You shine like stars in the world, like lights in the world, holding fast to the word 
of life. In fact, this is your calling, young people. This is for everybody, but this is your calling to shine like stars in a wicked and corrupt generation. And God will give you the grace to do it. To stand out by standing up. When the whole world said yes to sin and to wickedness and to violence and to perversion, Noah said no. I don't care what everybody else is doing. I will not go there. We can be people of peace in a world of bloodthirsty violence. We can. We can be people of purity in a world of perverted sexuality. Is it possible? Yes, it's possible. We can be people of generosity in a world of grasping greed. We can be. It's possible. We stand out when we stand up for the word of truth, for the truth of God, and refuse to bow down and to blend in with the rest of the world in rebellion against God. Are you going to stand up and stand out? Or are you going to bow down and blend in? My dad's favorite story is the story of Daniel and the three Hebrew children. And literally, when Nebuchadnezzar said, when you hear the horns play, everybody bow down. Can, now, can you imagine a whole crowd of people, a mass of people, when they hear the song play out, everybody literally bows down. And can you see the three Hebrew children standing up and everybody else bowed down. They stood out because they stood up. They didn't blend in when everybody else bowed down. That's e it's easy to blend in, isn't it? Isn't that the easy way to go? Isn't there a temptation to do that? Everybody else. I don't want to be the one that stands out. I don't want to be the one that, what's wrong with this person? But this is exactly what Daniel did. This is exactly what Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego did. This is exactly what Noah did as well. Now, I want you to listen to me very closely here. We don't stand out by lifting ourselves up. Right? Say, hey, look at me. I'm better than everybody else. This is not what Jesus has in mind at all. This is not what the Bible has in mind. Jesus tells a story about the self-righteous Pharisee that found a place where everybody could see him. He said, hey, look at me. And he looked up to God and said, Lord God, I'm so thankful. I'm, so, I'm better than everybody else. This is not what he has in mind at all. It doesn't say that Noah went to the highest place he could find and he pointed a finger of self-righteous condemnation to everybody. No, that's not what it says at all. It says something much more simple than that. Why did he stand out? It says that he walked with God. He walked with God. And this is the explanation for everything else in his life. Just before the story of Noah, there's another person who walked with God. Enoch walked with God. And he was not because God took him. Now, a flood was coming. God saved Enoch from that. When we walk with God, we're going to be saved. Sometimes God saves us by snatching us out of the flood to come. Sometimes God, when we walk with God, he rescues us through the flood. He saves us through the flood. Either way, when we walk with God, God saves us. So his life was a stark contrast to the rest of humanity. He walked with God Chapter 5, this genealogy. Adam lived, he died. Seth lived, he died. Enosh lived and died. Kenan lived, he died. Mahalalel lived and died. Jared lived and died. Enoch, verse 24, you just, just turn a page back in your Bible. Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. Enoch did not die, but God took him. Why? He escaped death because he walked with God. Now listen to what, the way the Bible thinks about what it means to walk with God. He has showed you, O oh man, Micah 6, 8 says, what is good and what does the Lord require of you? We just heard the song a minute ago, Stand Up, Stand Up for Jesus. In the context of that song, it was standing up for righteousness and for freedom for the oppressed. To do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. To walk humbly. Not self-righteously. Noah was righteous, yes. Blameless, yes. He was not self-righteous. When every imagination of man's heart was only evil all the time, Noah walked with God, and that made all the difference. I have a feeling that Noah was righteous and blameless because he walked with God. His connection to God is the thing that made all the difference in his life. Noah was the exception that God found. Notice chapter 6, verse 22. 
Noah did this. He did all that God commanded him. By faith, Noah was willing to be a fool for God. Chapter 7, verses 1 through 4, Noah, God tells Noah to bring seven pairs of all the clean animals. Verse 5, Noah did all that the Lord had commanded him. The animals began to be gathered into the ark. Verse 9, two by two, male and female, went into the ark with God as God had commanded Noah. In a restatement, chapter 7, verse 15 and 16, they went into the ark with Noah, two and two of all flesh, in which there was the breath of life, and they, they entered male and female of all flesh, went in as God had commanded him, and the Lord shut him in. Noah obeyed God. He did what God said to do. Did it make sense? Probably not. And there are going to be a lot of things in life. When we're walking with God, God is going to tell us to do it, and it isn't going to make any sense. It doesn't matter that it makes sense to us. All that matters is that it makes sense to God. That's it. Was Noah saved? Yes. Noah was saved because Noah obeyed. He obeyed because he believed God. He believed God because he walked with God. When everything else was washed away, Noah was saved because Noah obeyed. It's interesting in the story of Noah, in, in, this, in this narrative, through all this commanding and doing, no one ever says a single word. He just does. God speaks and Noah obeys. Doesn't argue, doesn't knock back, doesn't ask for, ask for explanations. He just does it. A few points of application. Beyond what we've already talked about, and we're going to look at some of that again, but I think it's important to notice this that our lives can grieve God or give God comfort and joy. So how can my life affect God? He is the almighty, he's the omnipotent, all-knowing, infinite God. I can't do anything to it. Yes, we, we can. God is not a robot. God is a father in heaven. He is a person. It is possible for us to make God smile. The Bible says God rejoices over us. Noah comforted God as he stood up and he stood out. The Bible commands us in Ephesians 4.30, do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God. In Luke 10, verse 21, one of the most beautiful scenes in the Gospels, Jesus has sent the disciples out and they come back and report what the Holy Spirit has done through them. And the Bible says that Jesus rejoiced. What God was doing through the disciples made Jesus rejoice. Their obedience and their faith in following him. We can cause the Lord to rejoice. God is a father. God is a person, not a robot. The way I live, my obedience, walking with him, it brings joy to him. It brings comfort to God. Is my life grieving God by going with the flow? Or am I bringing comfort and joy to God by standing up for the truth? Now let me go back to this one more time because it's important, especially in a message like this. Noah was righteous, but he was not self-righteous. How do we stand up the beginning of Jesus preaching, Matthew chapter 5, shows us how to be different than the rest of the world. The Beatitudes show us that Jesus has called us to stand out and to stand up. How do we do that in this world? Listen to me, young people. Jesus said, blessed are the poor in spirit. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. That's the opposite of self-righteousness, the, the very opposite of it. It's the opposite of going around condemning everyone else. I'm poor in spirit. I know my need of grace. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. That's the opposite of blessed are the powerful who take what they want. Blessed are those who mourn, who mourn the unrighteousness, the injustice, the wickedness, the, the hurt and the pain in the world, who, who mourn that and mourn their own sin. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall be shown mercy. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. This is what it means to stand up and to stand out. 
Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are those who are, who are persecuted. Not that those who hurt anyone else. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Through the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, goodness, faithfulness, and self-control. These are the ways that we stand up and stand out. Now, it's fine. I, I'm, I'm, all for, I'm all for posting the Ten Commandments. That's, that's all good. That is God's word. But I heard someone say, and this, stuck, this lodged in my heart, why aren't we fighting to have the Beatitudes posted? Huh? What if we posted in the Supreme Court, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. What if we posted in the halls of Congress and the places of power, blessed are the poor in spirit, blessed are the meek. Hmm? These are the ways, following the footsteps of Jesus, that we stand up and stand out in the world. You stand up and you stand out by laying your life down. Hmm? It's the opposite of an in-your-face self-righteousness. There is a warning here as well. If you go with the flow, finally, you'll be gone with the flood. This is what everybody else did. Let's just do what everybody else, everybody else is doing it. And everybody else was washed away when the waters came. But if we refuse to go with the flow, finally, we won't be gone with the flood, but we'll be saved through it. The Bible says that there's another great day of judgment coming. Another great day of judgment. The Bible says it won't be water, but fire next time. 2 Peter 3, 5 through 7, they deliberately, people are saying, he's never coming back. If he was going to come back, he would have come back already. And Peter says, no, no, God is not slack concerning his promises. But remember that with the Lord a day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is as a day. He is being patient with you. He's giving you time to repent. But these people, they deliberately ignore this fact. By the word of God, the heavens existed long ago, and the earth formed out of water and by means of water through which the world then existed, was deluged with water and perished. This great day of judgment. But by the same word, the same word that said, I'm going to send a flood upon the earth, the heavens and the earth that now exist have been stored up, not for water, but for fire, being kept until the day of judgment and destruction of ungodly men. We need to understand that if we go with the flow, we're going to be swept away next time, not by water, but by fire. But we don't have to be. God gives us everything we need to stand up. Jesus said, Everyone who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house upon the rock. And the rain fell, the floods came, the winds blew and beat upon that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. And that is Jesus Christ. Everyone who hears these words of mine, this is the end of his sermon and does not do them, will be like a foolish man who built his house upon the sand. Built his house upon the sand. Well, everybody else in the world says this is the right thing to do. Everyone else in the world says that this is the right way to go. This is building your house upon the sand instead of the teaching of Jesus. And the rain fell. The floods came. And the winds blew. And beat against that house. And it fell. And the fall of it was great. The end of the story of Noah. The Bible says that Noah not only brought rest and comfort to God's heart. But in chapter 8 verse 4. He uses this same word to say after the flood was finished. The ark came to rest. Upon the mountains. Just as Noah had brought rest to God. God brought rest and salvation to Noah as well. We don't have to be swept away by judgment. We can find eternal rest in the security of Jesus. You can. You can, young people. Listen to me. You can stand up. And you can stand out. You can. The Bible says in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3, write this down. 
His divine power has given us everything we need. Everything we need for life and godliness. Through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. He's given you everything you need to stand up and to stand out. So finally we won't be swept away. Would you bow your heads with me? I wonder if there's someone here today that God's spirit has been saying to you, you have been following the crowd. You've been saying, well, this is what the world is telling me. This is the way the culture is sweeping us away downstream. I guess I'll just go. It's easier to go. It's going to be okay. Maybe there's somebody here today who needs to come down to the altar and say, Lord Jesus, I've decided to follow you. I will not turn back. Even though the whole world turned away, I will not. I will follow you all the way home. Is there somebody here today that Jesus is saying, stand up. Stand up. Stop going with the flow. My grace is sufficient with you, for you. I'm calling you to come to me and find rest in me so that you will find an eternal rest in me. I'm calling you today to be like Noah. That when God looks upon the world and sees the wickedness and the perversion and the injustice and all the ways this world has fallen, God is looking for those who will stand up and say, Jesus, I will follow I know that I'm not going to be perfect. I'm going to fall down. But I know your grace is sufficient for me. I want to stand out the way Jesus did. Is there somebody here today who needs to come down to this altar and give your life to him? Is there someone here today that the Spirit of God is speaking to you and dragging you down to the front of this church to get down on your knees and to pray? The altars are open. If you need to pray for whatever reason, you're invited to come. Father in heaven, thank you for Noah. Lord, we know that he wasn't perfect. We know that at the end of his story, he fell as well. But you are gracious and you are merciful. Lord, I pray today that your Holy Spirit would move among us. Help us to know that your grace is enough. Your grace is sufficient. Your grace is greater than our, than our sin. And help us to hear again that call to take up our cross every day and follow you. That people might see the light of our lives and come to know you as their Savior. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Would you stand? As the hymn of invitation is sung, I invite you to come. With every head bowed and every eye closed, if God is calling you to come, come down. We will pray with you. To follow Jesus. Can you sing this from your heart? You may need to come by yourself. That's okay. We'll meet you here and pray with you. Do you need to come? Do you know that your life is right with the Lord? That your life is putting a smile on the face of God? Or is your life right now grieving the heart of God? If it is, why don't you come and pray? every head bowed and every eye closed as Marion plays softly take a moment to allow God's spirit to speak to your heart what is God saying to you today to you it's no accident that you are here God is reaching out to you Father, I pray for these precious people that you love with all of your heart. 
Lord, it's true that I don't know what they're going to face tomorrow morning. I don't know what it's like at home. I don't know what it's like in the hallway at school. I don't know what it's like at their job. But Father, your word tells us that in Jesus, our great high priest, we don't have a high priest who is unable to sympathize all that we go through. That he's faced every temptation. He knows the strength of it. He knows the difficulty of it. He knows what it's like to pray on his face with tears falling to the earth. Thank you, Father, that we have a Savior who knows, who has gone before us, who is the author, the pioneer, and the finisher of our faith. Your word calls us to keep our eyes on Jesus. I pray, Lord, that as we go from this place today, we keep our eyes on Jesus, who has already won all the battles, all the victories for us, and he calls us to follow after him. Lord, give our people, give these people grace to follow faithfully in the footsteps of our Lord Jesus, that their light would shine, and that people would come to know you through your Son by the power of your Spirit. When your people, when these precious people, these precious brothers and sisters, by your grace, stand up and stand out in this world for your glory. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. I'm going to ask Cal to come and challenge us. And then, and then Jason, after Cal, come on up, brother. Morning, church. Good morning, Cal. Brother Jeff challenged us to stand out, and I want to take a moment. Uh, this, this isn't on my script, but uh, I want to take a moment to uh, brag on one of our sisters who, who stands out to me every Sunday morning, and that's Sister Linda right here on the fourth row. Um, I, I happened to be standing at the entrance this morning um, whenever her and Wes walked up. And um, as she always does, she has that great big smile on her face. And she said, uh, are you ready for another Cal joke this morning? <laughs> and I said, I said, well, I think so. And she said, well, I hope you don't have any calamities this morning. <laughs> and she said, but if you do, remember, God is on your side. If God is for us, who can be against us? Sister Linda, thank you for, for standing out and always being uh, joyful. Um, truly is an encouragement. Thank you. Um, don't forget, tonight at 6.30, we're having session two uh, of our Breaking the Huddle book study. Uh, and just to give you a sneak peek, uh, I wanted to read um, a little excerpt from, the, uh, from section one of our book that we're going to be uh, going through tonight. Um, so this section is called Redeeming Huddles. The hope is this. Christian huddles have a way of turning into amazing plays. We may decry the holy huddle, but let's extend the American football analogy. Teams get into a huddle in order to do what? To prepare for the next play. The players face each other in a tight circle before each play. The other team cannot enter. They need this private space to get crystal clear on the next play. They have to be close enough to tune out the crowd and hear the quarterback call the play. This is how they become single-minded, which is key to success. There is also camaraderie in the huddle. They regroup, they refocus, and they keep the momentum going. In that sense, a Christian huddle is a good thing. It allows us to develop camaraderie and unity, and it helps us focus on the next play what God's word calls us to be about and to do. And it allows our God-appointed leaders an opportunity to speak to us and guide us as a whole group. Huddled communities have this going for them. They are circled up. They are together. Christian community can be similar to a football huddle. We huddle together because we yearn to be with people who understand and think like us. We need other Christians for joy vision, community, and guidance to keep walking the faith journey. There is camaraderie and shared motivation and practical help to keep moving forward in our quest to know Jesus and become more like him. 
Jesus himself had many huddled moments with his disciples. He created private conversations. They needed to hear the inside scoop about what Jesus was thinking. They needed some time alone with their master. The huddle was designed for us Christians to get what we need from God and each other so that we can better fulfill the great commission that Jesus gave us to go and make disciples. And that is where breaking the huddle comes in. Wouldn't it be odd if a football team stayed in their huddle forever on the field? Can you all imagine watching that Red River showdown yesterday? 40,000 in crimson and 40,000 in burnt orange just watching a couple of huddles just remaining huddled together the whole time. Um, The challenge in huddled communities is that the scope and the purpose of the huddle may have gotten lost along the way. The huddle that was designed for vision, clarity, and guidance to keep moving toward the mission God gave us as believers has become the mission. We mistake Christian community as the mission versus the Great Commission as the mission. But the great hope of leading a huddled community is that God's people have within their spiritual DNA a pulsing desire to live out the kingdom of God and to be about God's mission. So I hope to see you tonight here in the sanctuary at 630. And also, uh, don't forget, our next church-wide community prayer walk will be uh, next Sunday evening. So thank you all. Have a great Sunday. All right, Brother Jason, come on up. Somehow I knew that since... They're still standing for Jesus. Yeah, that's right. If you want to be seated, you can. I don't know how long this is going to take. Go ahead. You can be seated. I, somehow I knew that since Texas A&M beat Alabama last night, Cal was going to bring up the football game somehow. So, our t- well, I won't say anything else, Caleb. Sorry. All right. We've got three big announcements here. Announcement number one, no meal this week on Wednesday night. We don't want you to get too used to it and take it for granted, okay? So we're cutting that out this week. You have to fix your own meal on Wednesday. Second thing, October 24th, Stokes Fall Festival, 245th anniversary of the Stokes Fall Festival. They immigrated here and was like, the first thing we need to do is set up a fall festival uh, for that. If you've never been, it's awesome. Uh, Don't feel like that you're not welcome because you've never been. Trust me, there's something to do for everybody. There's hay rides, there's games, there's basketball, if, if you're like, I don't want to do any of that, you just want to sit around the fire, there's people always sitting around the fire talking about how great the announcements are at church, and uh, so there's always something to do for everybody, it's great. Uh, and then finally, Trunk or Treat uh, is uh, October 27th, so Trunk or Treat, uh, non-Halloween official uh, Trunk or Treat going on here. Are we doing costume prizes, anything like that at all, do we know, is there prizes, anybody, anybody know? Is no one putting this on? Let's just say there's going to be prizes and they're going to be great. Things like uh, you get, you're the first to come to communion. Maybe like you get to go first to communion. You get like a no tithing, uh, get out of jail free card maybe. So you're going to want to go all out. Decorate your trunk. Decorate yourself. Be here for trunk retreat. It's going to be great. Okay, stand up. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine down upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace both now and forevermore. Amen. Amen. You're dismissed.